Father, we thank you that you've called us to a way of life that is not uh, normal. We thank you that you've said yes uh, when so many would have said no. We thank you for the fact that you keep saying yes to us when we um, oftentimes fall short. And so, Father, I pray that you would write your story not only on our hearts, but, Lord, that that story would be told through um, what is going on in our lives. And so, Lord, we trust you with it all, and we pray these things in the saving name of Jesus. Amen. All right, kiddos, come on down. We have the Hernandi over here ready to rock and roll, give you guys some awesome, uh, awesome things to do during the service today and all that good stuff. So y'all come on down. While they're doing that, anybody in this room ever been around a group of Christians and been extremely uncomfortable before? Oh my gosh, me too. You know, there are certain populations of Christians that, oh man, it is the most uncomfortable thing to be around them. There's this internal lingo that can take place sometimes. They got all these thoughts and they got all these things that are saying and everything sounds great. They talk about caring for people. They talk about doing all these things. But you can tell in the midst of those conversations that what's coming out of their mouth and what real life looks like are two very different things. You can tell that all the right words are being said about caring for people, but you can tell that they are so insulated by other Christians that they are isolated from the unchurched. And that while they may be saying all the right things and giving all the right answers, the practical application from head knowledge to heart application is a far, far cry. It's kind of crazy. You hear people talk about uh, the special music that they're going to sing on a Sunday. Uh, you talk about hearing them, uh, or you hear them talk about um, being so excited that, that people are becoming a part of their church only to find out that the people they're inviting to church are people who are already a part of another church. And they're just trying to kind of pull them over and we're so excited that they're here, but it's just a bunch of unchurched, or it's just a bunch of church people moving from church to church to church. And you can tell that there's a holiness that's associated, but it's not that crawl up on the cross and die to yourself holiness. It's a little bit more like hashtag too blessed to be stressed holy. You know what I mean? You've been around these Christians before. I will tell you right now, when I'm around this population of people, I am never more uncomfortable than at that moment. And it is really challenging and it's really hard. And sometimes I feel, and my guess is there's several of you in this room that, that have felt before more like a foreigner around people that we should be family. There's an understanding, there's a, there's a knowledge that, that they should know better. But you know, in that same moment that I say all these things, I'm also reminded about the culture in which we live. I don't want to just throw shade at the Christian community. There's also this culture in which we live that I get reminded of the fallen nature of our world through interactions with people who literally hate other people because of the color of their skin. Still in the 21st century, this exists. Hate people because of their gender preference. Hate people because of a sexual orientation. Hate people because of a, of a political view. There's this fallen nature of our world that is really, really ugly and really, really hard. The good news is that God has so much to say about this. God has so much to say about how we navigate life here on this earth knowing full well that this earth is not our home. That we are like foreigners in this land. We know that home is eternity in paradise. And so there is this navigation that we get faced with on a regular basis and the fact that this actual home versus a foreigner in our own land kind of home it impacts the way we function. It impacts the way that we respond to people and how we think and talk and all those kinds of things. Last week, Darren did a great job of, of, of introducing this series that, that we're called to be different. We're called to function outside of the quote-unquote norm. And he was writing in that moment, uh, in, in this time period, he was writing to hurting Christians. Christians who were living in a land that were not their home. And as he's writing to them, he's helping them understand that there is a different response 
that is required than the normal response, especially when it comes to crisis. When there's crisis in our life, we as Christ followers respond differently than the world in which we live. We respond differently than the norm. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, I'm writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. God is looking at and speaking through Peter to the early church, to the early Christians saying, because you are not from here, you don't live like those from here. And we're able to read that and we're able to apply that in 21st century life and understand that followers of Jesus are not called to look like the rest of the world. We're called to have different values. We're called to have different standards, different goals. And because of our good God, we learned last week that our faith, we have a different faith when it comes to trials. It's different. Our faith in the future, our hope in the future, it's different of what it looks like on the other side. We have an understanding and we live under the understanding, whatever the situation may be, that it is going to be okay. Whatever okay means. This is the way we operate. Because we know that God will see us through to the other side, even though we don't know what the other side looks like. We don't know what okay means. We just know it's going to be okay. We're, respond, we're responding differently, whether it's a medical condition with a child, whether it's a contentious marriage relationship, financial troubles, job loss, all kinds of different things that can bubble to the top circumstantially. And today I stand before you, I will tell you that I'm so thankful that the my it's going to be okay means that my bride is sitting in this room today, two weeks after her surgery that she had. And I'm so thankful for that, right? Make no mistake, I am very grateful that it's going to be okay is the way it's played out. But I am in no way sticking my head in the sand and knowing that it's going to be okay could mean she's not here today. And I don't say that lightly. I say that because no matter which way, God is good. No matter which way, we get on the other side. Because understand, there's several of you who've been praying, have been praying for my bride, and the, the prayer that you've been praying is complete healing. Now I know and you know that what you're praying is that you long for complete healing in her body here on this earth, and I am thankful for that. But please understand, complete healing She's dead today and in paradise. That's complete healing. I'm so thankful that her healing isn't complete healing uh, in that she's in heaven. At the same time, you know, we would be okay if she was. We just have to understand and wrap our minds around the full picture and the full gravity. And we're grateful for what we have. And we're grateful for the opportunities we have. Because God is good either way, and there is trust either way. It doesn't mean there's a loss of a battle. It may mean there's victory in the war. There's lots of application here. We have different faith when it comes to trials. A very different faith. And so this week we get to, to launch into the next truth that because of our good God, we have different values in an unholy culture. Because of God's goodness, we then have different values in an unholy culture. Today we'll be continuing in the First Peter uh, chapter 1 passage. We'll, be, we'll pick up in verse 13 and continue on. Peter says, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace of to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. You see, we're temporary residents here on this earth. This is not our eternal home. 
We know that our bodies are simply tents that are housing our being. They are housing our soul. And our home is paradise. Our home is heaven. And we long for heaven, even though we try to capture every day and make the most of every opportunity that comes our way. Now, what we can read through what God is saying through Peter here is that here on this earth, for many people, the greatest obstacle to following Christ is their desire to fit in. It's the greatest obstacle. This desire to socially be accepted, this desire for people to see what we're doing and to approve of what we're doing or not doing. It's this desire to where we're not looked at as weird. This desire to fit in is one of the greatest obstacles to following Jesus. What we have to wrap our mind around today is that God didn't create people to fit in. He created people to stand out. Now, we celebrate standout athletes. We celebrate standout financial managers. We celebrate entrepreneurs. We celebrate celebrities. We celebrate people who stand out in all of these ways culturally. And then from there, the ironic thing is, is that people then form their life around behaving in similar patterns so as to be approved of culturally as these standouts are approved of culturally. This is not what God had in mind. In fact, Jesus said quite the opposite. Jesus says, wide is the road and broad is the path that leads to destruction. And so the greatest way we know for a life to end in destruction is just do what everybody else is doing. Fit in. Step right into culture. Step right into mainstream life. Step right into a way of dressing. Step right into a way of thinking. Step right into a way of spending money. Step right into conventional wisdom about situations. Step right into those things. And you are well on your way to a path of destruction. Just try to be like somebody else. When we fit in, we are on a path to destruction. Jesus says, small is the gate. Small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life. The hardest truth in this whole thing is what he says next. He says, few will find it. Few will find it. Because there's so much draw to the things of this world. There's so much draw to the American dream. There's so much draw to global thought processes. There's so much draw to these things. So we need Jesus. We need him to help us be like a salmon swimming upstream, right? We need him. So let's ask him. Father, we need you right now, and we need Jesus to save us from ourselves. Right now, would you open our minds, and would you do what you do, where you help us see the truth when the enemy is telling us so many lies that sound and look and feel and all that so good. But, Lord, it only will end in destruction. Father, we want life. And we want to be living on this earth, not just sucking wind. We want to find the fullness of life. And, Lord, we need you to help us deny our preconceived ideas of what that means so that we can really find your way. And we know Jesus is the way to that. So, Lord, will you help us today? We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Take just a moment, find five people sitting right around you and look at them and say, you're different. How fun was that to tell somebody they're different? Did you notice what happened in the room? You look at each other, you're like, you're different. And then it's, you're different. You know, and you're like, you're different. I mean, it's like, isn't that funny? How we're sitting there and it's, it's, it, we laugh in this room, but yet it's the thing that most people on this earth fear, being told, you're weird. Being told, you march to your own little beat, don't you? You know, uh, you know, I, it's such an interesting dynamic because there's this pressure to fit in. There's this fear of being set apart and be that weird person. But yet, that's exactly who God calls us to be. 
in a very unique way because if you think of Jesus, who wanted to be around Jesus more than anybody else? People who didn't love God. Is that not the most strange thing? We have this fear of being rejected by our culture, by being weird as a Christ follower, yet if we're truly following Jesus, our culture will want to be around us. Isn't that crazy? That's Jesus. The most uncomfortable people around Jesus were the church people. So we got to wrap our minds around this. There's a calling here. There's a thought process. We've got we to figure out what this really, really means. The greatest obstacle to following Jesus is the desire to fit in. Small is the gate, narrow is the road. Now, what I am not talking about today is behavior modification. Because, see, we as pull ourselves up by the bootstraps kind of people, we tend to think, okay, I'm so, this is supposed to be manifested in me, so therefore I must create this. I'm supposed to love, so therefore I have got to make sure I love. I'm supposed to have joy, so therefore I'm going to have to capture and take joy today. I'm supposed to be full of peace, so I'm going to declare peace in the name of Jesus today. And these are the things that we do as believers. And that's when you get labeled as weird. Because you're trying to manifest something that you can't create. Only Christ in you can manifest these things in and through you. And that's where we mess it up, about behavior modification. Now, whenever I was a, a young warthog, whenever I was a young little boy, um, there was this tape that I had. Now, a tape, teenagers, is, is this little thing about this big. It had two holes in it. You stuck it in this player and you pressed play in a jam box. All right? In a jam box. It came, yeah, anyway. So, so I had this tape of Dire Straits Brothers in Arms. Anybody know Dire Straits? Praise Jesus, right? For people who don't love Jesus. Anyway, um, yeah, Dire Straits Brothers in Arms. I got this tape and I was so excited. Um, you know, my mom and dad in a, moment, a lapse of judgment had said, yes, I can buy this one. And because uh, my mom didn't know what was on it. And, uh, and so, so I have this tape and my friend across the street, he had the same tape. And he had a jam box too. Now I had to borrow my brother's jam box, but I, I was still able to do it. So we, we devised this plan where I would sit on my front porch, he would sit on his front porch, and, and at the precise time we would press play at the same time and we would play this song in our neighborhood. And when it got to a certain point, we were gonna crank it up as loud as it would go because there was a sweet guitar part. Oh my gosh, it's awesome. And so we were just gonna do it. And uh, so we took our pencils and we made the, we got the tape exactly where it needed to be. You got me? Pencil right where it needed to be. We put it in the player and no touch anything else. Just put it there. He walks across the street. I'm on my front porch. We press play and oh, that beautiful song came on. And then that guitar part, we just kind of went, you know, and we cranked the volume to which the very next thing that happened in my reality was the front window went whoa, up. My mother said, Daniel, get in here. That's what I get next, and I'm like, uh oh, this was maybe not my best plan. And uh, this kind of played out about the same as the day that my friend were out in the front yard, and my friend told me that the middle finger was something bad, and I didn't believe my friend. So I thought, I'm just going to prove you wrong. And so I ran around in my front yard, just my middle finger up, everybody's, everybody's walking around, everybody's driving down the road, and I'm there, and next thing you know, that front window, <laughs> Daniel, get in here. That's about the way that played out in my life. So my mom comes in and she says, you will never do this again. Um, and, uh, you know, because this is, I mean, this is all of our neighbors. You're disturbing all of our neighborhood. Um, all this kind of thing. And this is, this is not okay. Plus, I'm pretty sure I may have heard a word in there that I don't really appreciate very much. And, uh, and so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, you know what, mom? This is all well and good, and I won't do this again like this. And so my outside behavior... I honored my mom and I did what she said to do. And I said, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. And inside I was going, no way, no way, no way, no way. Anybody ever been there? Woo. Admittance is our first step, everybody. You see, this is behavior modification, where the outside is modified to a way that is approved, but yet the inside is still just as deviant as it has ever been. Parents, 
Kids can be obedient on the outside and at the exact same time be cussing you out on the inside. You remember as a child, you remember this happening in your life, but what we are talking about now is that we are not seeking acting right. We are not seeking the right behavior. What we are seeking is for the inside and the outside to match. This is what we long for more than anything. Why does it matter? Why in the world does it matter? Well, let's work back through verse 14 through 16. As obedient children, Peter says, do, and children, obviously not just kids, all of us as children of, of, of God, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he called you as holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now the problem is when we read this, we subconsciously in a lot of ways read, be holy because I am holy. We read, be happy. Be happy. Just as he who called you is happy, so be happy in all you do. Because isn't that what God wants for you? Doesn't God just want you to be happy? He just wants you to be pleased and happy and all these things. It's the way we typically shift it. The hard part is that so many people wrongly believe God's highest calling is their happiness. So many people on this earth believe this is God's goal for you and me, is for us to be happy. When the truth is God's highest calling for people is not their happiness, but their holiness. That's God's desire. It's not just to make you happy. It's not for me just to be happy. Because the problem with this theology of happiness that we have, the problem is that it empowers personal justification for sin. When we operate out of God just wants me to be happy, we then, if I am not happy, then what I cognitively begin to justify is it is okay for me to be doing it is okay for me to do something that is otherwise wrong. If I'm not happy, God desires for me to be happy, therefore I am able now to do something because this is what God wants for me. I now am able to do something that is wrong. This is how our minds begin to justify due to the fact that we believe that God's greatest desire is for you and me to be happy. So therefore, if I am not happy in my marriage, I will leave my marriage. If I am not happy and I want this thing, even though I cannot afford this thing, I will now buy this thing because God wants me to be happy. It's how we handle our finances. Because God, I deserve this. I work very hard for what I have. And therefore, I'm going to get what I want. And we justify it because God must want this for me. He must want me to be happy. I'm dating somebody and I know in my mind and I believe in my heart, I know that we should wait. I know that we should wait. We shouldn't move in together yet. We shouldn't be having sex right now. We shouldn't be. I know we should wait. But the truth is we're in love. We're totally in love. And God will understand. Because after all, he wants our happiness. He wants our happiness so much so that even though, I mean, well, the truth is we're going to get married someday anyway. And we justify it's okay perfectly fine. Church, when people believe that God wants them to be happy above all else, it's in these moments that God gets blamed for discomfort. It's in these moments that when risk shows up and suffering begins to show up in life, the natural response is, this can't be God's will. It can't be, because God wants me to be happy. No, God wants you to be holy. And sometimes the only way for you to be holy is to go through hell on this earth to get to maturity, completeness, where you're not lacking anything. There's truth. We don't 
like this truth, though, because our theology of happiness says, that ain't right. That's not what God, he wants what's good. God's a good God. He only wants good things. Yep. And sometimes the very best thing is to escort you through the fire to get on the other side. That's it. But when the goal is happy, you know what? When the goal is happy, that means God exists to serve me. When, God, when, when the goal is happy, God exists to serve me. But, the, but God doesn't exist to serve us. God doesn't exist to serve us. We exist to serve God. God is the one who is holy. And our desire is to be like him. Our desire is to be like God. We want to be holy. God doesn't exist to serve us. We exist to serve God. And so in this holiness, there is a set apart. There is a, a difference, a purity that comes with this holiness. Now, sitting in this room, I have three daughters sitting in this room today. And I've talked to them about this beforehand. I have three daughters and I have one son that's in this room. And Rachel and I, when they were little bitty, 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 in fact, in the actual room as soon as they were born, in that moment, uh, other than Sam, we got Sam whenever he was a little bit older, but, um, but with the girls, when they were in the delivery room, and the first time hold, it was then that immediate moment that we placed and said, these, these children are yours, Lord. And these, these babies are yours. And since then, there's been a desire and a hope and a dream that our daughters would be set apart, that they would be different, that they truly would be pure. And there is this, this understanding that the, the ways the world tends to work is it fights against these values, it fights against these things. And so parents, let me ask you a question today. How do you, as parents, instill these values how do you instill, don't answer it out loud, but just in your mind, think, how do you instill being set apart, being different, and being pure? How do you instill these values in your children? I would argue you instill them by not doing that. You don't instill these values in your kids. You can't instill these values in your children. This is my argument today. But what you can do, what I can do, what Rachel can do, what all of us can do, what future parents can do, what we can do is we can teach that there are children's values are to follow Jesus and have the courage to be different. Follow Jesus. If a life is patterned after Jesus, you will have no worry. The value is to be set apart, different, and pure. Now, obviously, we know there's sin on this earth. And we get that. There's temptation, there's pressures, and there's all of these things. And we by no means have our heads stuck in the sand. But the goal and the hope is set apart, different, pure. And early on, we tried to model this as best we possibly could with our kids. Some days we did good, other days we did bad, and we looked at our kids and apologized for our failures. And that's an important thing. But one of the things that we realized a long time ago, see, well, there was a day in mine and Rachel's life where we were pretty dang cool people. Now, Rachel's still dang cool. I me, mean, uh, I'm really not. And I'm perfectly okay with not being cool. I got to the place in my life where I realized I am totally not cool. Because we do lots of really uncool things as parents. Like, for example, in my home, PG-13 means PG-13. If you are 13, if you can watch PG-13. If you are not 13, you don't watch PG-13. We read the user agreements. And if an app says you need to be 13 years of age in order to use this app, you must be 13 years of age in order to use this app. We're not going to lie for our kids, and our expectation is they're not going to lie in order to get this app. There's no technology in bedrooms. In fact, when friends come over, and many of you can attest to this, when friends come over, they're staying the night, all technology stays downstairs in a common area, and when you wake up in the morning, that technology comes back to you. That is really not cool, just for the record. It is not cool at all. Our children have this little app on their phone that, that says Life 360. Now, those of you who don't know what Life 360 is, parents, you are so welcome for what I'm about to tell you. Because what Life360 is, is a little app where it's connected to your child's phone in that everywhere they go, you can see this little dot on the road. 
You can see this little dot, and it stops, and it alerts you and stops exactly on the home in which they are stopped in. Obviously, they have to have their cell phone with them. Yes, we know all that stuff. We're not sticking our head. But that's really not cool. We're really not cool parents at all. We do things all the time that, like, for example, this whole 13 thing, well, Instagram, you've got to be 13 years old in order to utilize Instagram per the user agreement that you agree to. You've got to be 13 years of age. Well, well, our student ministry uses Instagram as a primary form of communication with students. Well, I have two 12-year-olds in the student ministry. They've been in there all year this last year in which they have to hear from their sister as to what's going on or from their mom as to what's going on or from their dad as to what's going on and oh my gosh that's not cool we're not cool at all we're really not, really not cool parents truth is we can't expect to raise children who are different from the world if we're not I don't want to put any undue pressure on my, my daughters. And we're eyes wide open on all of that. And they know we have just established a target on them by me even telling this story. The church family, we can't expect to raise children who are different from the world if we're not. If we want to fit in, if we want to teach our children to deceive not only us, but try to deceive God, but try and try to deceive friends and try to deceive other folks. Let's say yes to things that color outside the lines. First Peter 1 14, let's read it again. We'll read it in a different translation. You must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Every single one of us sitting in this room know it's really easy to slip into sin. It's really easy to fall into temptation. We know that. We also know the truth is nobody falls into righteousness. Nobody accidentally becomes holy. There's nobody that does these things. Because Satan always twists the truth, doesn't he? Doesn't he? It's kind of like what he said to Eve, but he says it to you. And he goes, did God really say you shouldn't watch that M.A. movie on... Netflix, you know the mature audience, you're a grown man, you're a grown woman, you can do whatever you want to do. Did God really say not to watch that? Did he really say not to post half-naked pictures on Instagram while you're at the beach so that every man in the church can see you? I mean, did he really, did he really say that? Did he really say these things? Did, I mean, did he say that music with bad language in it? Do you really say that it's bad, that it's going to put things in your head that are unclean, that are not good for you, that are going to make you think certain ways? Did, he really, did God really say that? Did God really say that gossip is a sin? I mean, after all, you're just wanting to pray for somebody. You just need to know some details to be able to pray for them. And then that way, when you go to prayer meeting or a prayer gathering later on, you can tell everybody what's going on so that they can then pray for that person. It's not gossip, is it? See, isn't that how this works? Satan twists the truth. Even to where we start thinking, you know, I'm not that bad. I'm a lot better than a lot of other people. There's a lot of other people who do a whole lot worse than I do. Please understand, a lot of other people is not the standard, church. That's not the standard that God has called us to. He didn't say, be better than most. He said, be holy, be set apart, be pure. Let's take a moment and look through four questions for reflection. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do this. Either you can wait for them all to come up on the screen, take a picture of it so you got your phone, or just go to the app, LGLP at LC, um, and, and get that app, and you've got all these sermon notes are all in there, so you can access these things through there. One of a couple of ways, but let's just kind of go through these. Question for reflection. What are three areas that I struggle most trying to fit in? When you look at our culture, what are three areas I struggle most trying to fit in? Is it the way I look? Is it 
I don't know, car I drive? Is it material things like that? Or is it, is it the way my family looks when we're in public? What is it? What are the three areas I struggle most trying to fit in? Second question. When was a time I put my happiness above God's call for holiness? When is there a time that in my mind I justified my happiness over and above God's holiness? Because there was this thought process that God wants me to be happy. When was the time? The next question is this. What are the biggest ways that I'm different from the world? What are the things that you are currently doing? The decisions that you're currently making that you know come from within you in such a way that there is a difference between you and the onlooking world. What are the biggest ways that I'm different? Is it the fact that you sit down as a family and eat dinner every night of the week together? Is it the way you parent? Is it the way you apologize to your children? Is it, what is, what is it? What's the biggest ways that I'm different than the world? The last question is this. What is the area that God wants me to be different? There's an area right now. There may be something that's, that's been bouncing around your head this whole time. What is the area that God wants me to be different? Now, in just a few moments, we're going to have a time of response. And these would be great questions to kind of work through as we sing and as we, as we reflect on today's truth. But as we finish up today, why does it even matter? Why does it even matter if you're holy or not? Why does it even matter if I'm holy or not? Why? Why does that matter? And I'll answer that reading verses 18 through 21. You know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But it was with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Why does it matter? Because Jesus came to this earth and died for you. That's why it matters. Because God breathed life into you chose you as creation, saw you as special, saw you as his child, sent Jesus to redeem the sin and shame of your life. This is why it matters. Because there is a story that is being told, there's a, there's a story that is being written that you and I cannot write. But it's a story that can be written through you and me. This is why it matters. Because there is a glorification process of our Heavenly Father. That we long for the truth of who God is to be revealed. And we as the church should want to tell that story more than any other story. That's why it matters. God says, be holy because I am holy. Because of who He is, because of what He's done, we then want to be holy. Not that we have to be, but the, we then want to be holy. See, this is the difference between behavior modification and spiritual transformation. This is the difference between our outside looking really good but the inside being completely dark. The difference between that and the outside and the inside matching up. And so what people see on the outside is truly the story. It's really what's going on. Church family, I know you know this, but I need to say it. People in this room that you're still kicking the tires and trying to figure out who Jesus is and everything, please hear these next two statements. Living holy is not the path to knowing Christ. Doing all the right things, that is not the path to knowing Christ. It's not it. Knowing Christ is the path to living holy. You cannot do it right. It only comes through Christ in you. It's the only way that it works. Father, we pray today a prayer longing, longing to hear your voice in our, in our minds, longing to hear your, 
your voice in our hearts, and Lord, we long to live this life in a way that is different. There are people who are trying to live a life that is different, but yet it's really just to glorify self. Father, we long to lose life so that we can truly find it. We want to, we want to put aside, we want the bitter roots to be cut off. We want to, we want to stop trying to figure, think that we can figure this thing out. And we want to rely upon you in a way where you're telling your story. We just happen to get to be a conduit that you're passing this information and this life change through. And so Lord, we long for our life to look like Jesus, but we know we can't do enough to make it get there. So Father, we need Jesus. We need Jesus to where we're willing to choose to live a life that is different. Not because that gives us kudos from our friends, but because we want to honor you with every cell in our body. Every thought, every notion, every desire. We want to please you. So, Father, we need Jesus to save us. We need your spirit to guide us. We want to be in deep relationship as we long for heaven, as we long for eternity, in relationship with you, our heavenly Father. So, Father, will you come? And will you set us free today from the rat race of life to where we live a life that is truly different. We pray these things through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.